All right, so where are we then in our investigation of the new covenant? Well, we've seen that in Jeremiah 31, which is part of a, um, a revelatory uh, group of chapters that are thematically arranged around the uh, promises of God and the covenantal promises of God, that uh, the new covenant there in chapter 31, 31 through 34 is made with Israel, Israel and Judah. This is repeated for us by the author of the book of Hebrews. Now, by the way, please note that Hebrews is so titled, and even if one wants to quibble about whether that's the original title of the book or not, that's the title that we have. Uh, the books, by the way, usually in the ancient world did have titles appended to them. Uh, but bypassing that, uh, the book of Hebrews, even if it uh, is not the original title, is certainly the most uh, Israelite-ish or um, he Hebraic book in the New Testament, that and the Gospel of Matthew, and that needs to be understood in uh, any understanding or interpretation of it. But the book of Hebrews uh, cites that whole passage from Jeremiah 31, and doesn't change it. It includes, again, the uh, tribes of Israel and the tribes of Judah. So uh, what we have to do if we're dealing with the new covenant is that we have to find a way of reconciling those two things, the, the fact that the book of Hebrews just quotes the Jeremiah passage and applies it to future Israel, uh, while also understanding such passages of, as uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul says that uh, we are ministers of the new covenant. And he's clearly talking about the gospel there and the, the good news in Christ. And 1 Corinthians 11, where he's talking about the Lord's Supper, which the church partakes of, and which Christ instituted, as we'll see in a second, uh, when he was instituting the new covenant. So we have to be able to find a way of bringing these different strands together. And the way to do it is actually just observe what the Bible says about Christ's mediatorial role in or as the covenant. So turning here to some scriptures, let's look first at uh, Christ's words of institution in Luke 22. Uh, in verse 19 of that chapter, we read that he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul uses these very words when he's talking to us about how to celebrate the Lord's Supper. In the words of institution here, uh, verse 25, the Apostle says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So uh, it's quite clear, therefore, that Jesus is instituting the new covenant there with a symbol or with a token of the new covenant, which is the Lord's Supper that we take. Paul doesn't skip a beat in applying that to the New Testament church. Therefore, any interpretation that we have of the new covenant cannot just uh, make it the premise of, the, of Old Testament Israel or the future Israel. It's got to include the church too. How can we do that? Well, we can do that by paying attention to the prophets already uh, quoted. The fact is that Jesus is the new covenant. Let's think about this. Jesus is uh, said to be made a covenant by God that it's Christ's blood 
that is the new covenant. He doesn't shed the blood of an animal uh, and sprinkle us. He sheds his own blood. And then we have the testimony of the author of the book of Hebrews, which is where I, where I want to turn to next, Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm not going to give an extended exposition here, but I want to focus your attention on this important passage, which has often been misunderstood. It's in chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Now, uh, to help you to understand this, it would be good if you had a, a good translation of the scriptures, uh, the King James, New King James, New American Standard, or ESV, some of which, uh, the later ones by the way, uh, translate this passage more accurately than the King James and the New King James do. Throughout the uh, author's use of the word covenant, diatheke, in the book of Hebrews to this point, uh, the translation has been uniform. The translation has been covenant. But all of a sudden, when you get to verses 16 and 17, the translation shifts in some translations, even the good ones like the New King James that I'm using. And the, King, the New King James says this, for where there is a testament, now the Greek word there is diatheke, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testimony Oh, sorry, a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. And then it will go back to use the term covenant again. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Uh, we clearly understand that uh, a last will and testament isn't in force until the person who makes it uh, kicks the bucket and, and dies. And then the people for whom it was made, they come into the benefits of it. Well, the problem with that is that that's not the way covenants were made, or rather testaments were made in the ancient world. If you recall the prodigal son, the prodigal son got his inheritance before his father had died. And that was the way that it was often seen. And so that is not actually a, a right interpretation of what's meant here. Furthermore, in order to do that, one has to switch from using the term covenant to in two verses use the word testament or will. And that seems to be a little bit arbitrary. This becomes even more suspect when you actually retain the word covenant there, and you see what is being said. What actually the author of the book of Hebrews is doing is that he is saying that Christ, whose blood, by the way, he's already designated the blood of the new covenant, and who he's already designated the mediator of the new covenant, Christ offers himself. That's a major part of what the epistle to the Hebrews is about. And um, if you read it as a covenant instead of a testament, this is what you get in those verses. For where there is a covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the covenant animal. You would have to provide that latter word or the, the, the animal that makes the covenant. For a covenant is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the covenant animal lives. You see, covenants were often made with the sacrificial animal, and that was the thing that initiated the covenant. And so you, you find that, of course, in the Abrahamic covenant, for example. That was the way with the Mosaic covenant which is what the author of Hebrews here is comparing the New Covenant with. Uh, and that's the case with the New Covenant. But the animal, as we all know, is not a sheep or a goat. The animal is Jesus himself. 
Uh, later on in chapter 10, he quotes that passage, a body you have prepared for me. Well, what was the body for? The body was for sacrifice. Therefore, you see, Jesus is not only the called a covenant, it's his blood that is the blood of the new covenant. Uh, he's the mediator of the new covenant. And here he's designated as the, uh, the sacrificial animal. Uh, moreover, to believe in him is to enter into the new covenant. So I hope that you can see that there's a pretty strong case for identifying Jesus as the new covenant. Now, if Jesus is the new covenant, then all those past, present or future that have placed their faith in him are covered by the new covenant provisions. You say, well, hold on a minute. Uh, Jeremiah 31 just talks about Israel. Fine. You'd expect Jeremiah to be talking about Israel. You wouldn't expect him to be talking about the church. The church wasn't in existence when Jeremiah was writing in the 6th century BC. But that doesn't mean that the church can't enter into the provisions of the new covenant too, because there's one Savior. There's one Messiah. There's one Christ. Moreover, Think about how this fits into the creation project, as I've called it. All things were made through Christ and for Christ, according to Paul in, first, in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Uh, that being the case, how amazing it is that the one for whom everything was made now comes into the world as a human being, Philippians chapter 2, and becomes the covenantal sacrificial animal that ensures salvation and transformation for humanity and for the environment that was made for him by the Father. Moreover, of course, he will come to rule that uh, environment, which only makes sense. That makes sense also of the coming millennium, I hope you see. Uh, so Jesus as the new covenant, therefore, becomes the central focus of the covenantal program that one finds when, when one knits together the Noahic covenant, the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, the uh, covenant with Phineas and the Davidic covenant. All of them require the participation of Christ in order for them to, to uh, find their literal fulfillments. Again, why literal fulfillment? Because we are stubborn wooden literalists? No, it's simply because of the fact that covenants and oaths within those covenants are not pliable. They have to mean what they say. And by the way, we have entered into belief in Jesus Christ and on the, the basis of belief in his shed blood for us and his rising again for us, we have everlasting life. And God cannot change that covenant promise to us. It means what it says. Anyone who trusts in Jesus will be saved.